welcome to Practicing with Integrity, highlighting the pioneering spirit of modern dentistry with a comprehensive view of the techniques and technologies at the forefront of dental science. Welcome, Dr. Cesar Butura, to episode two of Practicing with Integrity. I've titled our episode, Partnering with Integrity. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for having me, Dr. Galindo. Yeah, I'm really happy for you to be here. We've worked together Excited. for a good number of years. A few. Um, and have shared a lot of experiences that hopefully we'll be able to share with our listeners. So we began working in June of 2008 when the first multi-specialty dental implant center opened in Arizona. And we had just met a few months before that opening. And then I've got to say, I had the pleasure of working with you for 16 years. And we'll get to more of this later. Let's talk about your training. Oh. So, <laughs> New Yorker. Yeah, New uh, Yorker. City Don't College. Don't against me. Don't say no. against me. <laughs> City College. Then you earned your dental degree at Columbia. Yeah, Columbia University. Mm -hmm. And why did you choose oral surgery? It's a great question. I still think of that today. Actually, it came back to my probably between junior and senior year of high school. I uh, spent some time with a friend of mine's mom who happened to be the head of the NICU at uh, Long Island Jewish Hospital. So what does the NICU have to do with oral surgery? Well, another gentleman, my, the same age, was also in the same little office whose dad happened to be an oral surgeon there. And I uh, said, like, hey, my dad's in the OR. Can you go, just go check it out? So this is before uh, OSHA prohibited <laughs> family members <laughs> from observing the operating, uh, operating room. But anyway, so I went in and I watched uh, Lafort one osteotomy. I was like, hey, that looks kind of cool. I might want to do that someday. Anyway, so went off to college, got a degree in chemistry, forgot about dentistry. And uh, somehow I came back and I went to Columbia afterwards. And then you chose your uh, residency at UIC. University it chose me, yeah, it Chicago, chose me. It chose you. <laughs> and uh, I know we spoke about this many, many times, but there were a lot of unique aspects of that residency that kind of defined your career. Let's, let's talk about a few of these. So um, as, as any type of surgical residency, there are two. There are really two types. There's a, something called a resident-run residency or an attending-run residency. So what's the difference? Uh, the resident-run residency is basically where you learn from a fellow resident. So it's the adage, see one, do one, teach one. A attending-run residency is basically you have someone sh over your shoulder the whole time. I'm not saying the resident-run residency is a, is a free-for-all, but it's about as close as you can get. So you're, giving a lot, you're given a lot of responsibility from day one. First time on trauma call for myself, I was really... Surprise when a young woman came with a very serious injury to the face. I called the second in, the second in sort of command for that evening, and I said, hey, just take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> so that went down the line. I mean, that was my, my, my training. It was learned by the bootstraps. And that uh, pretty much defined my, my um, objectivity to, to surgery, as uh, obviously you have to be able to deal with any problem that comes your way and have to be creative in dealing with those problems that come your way. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to treat the patients in the manner you, they should be treated. So you completed your, your residency, and then it's the real world. Yeah, the real world. So the real world was Chicago for a year, and then I went up to North Dakota for five, and then to Arizona. So little by little, you made your way yeah, west. To Arizona, yeah, listen yeah. to my wife. She wanted to be in Arizona. <laughs> We came back, <laughs> and you moved. You moved to Phoenix, two thousand three. Yeah. Correct. And uh, you were part of a practice that had two locations. Correct. Correct. You had been at a bigger practice in North with, Dakota. With six, you covered the whole state. Yeah, Did we, it, yeah, we pretty much okay. covered the whole the whole state. Seven locations. There's nothing like a daily drive to the office of a hundred miles, one way. <laughs> yeah, but well, that's that's that puts things in perspective yeah. for a lot of our listeners. How did your practices? start evolving into implant dentistry? So that's actually a really good question. And um, it has to be, it, 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 so the, I, my first exposure to implants was in 1993, where I took the first Brandemar course. 
And uh, if you re recall from those days, only surgeons could take those courses. Those are two-day courses, very heavily didactic. Surgeons and prosthodontists. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So um, they were heavily didactic, and I found them extremely boring. Because here I am a surgeon, I want to cut. I want to be in the OR, I want to fix people. Uh, implants seem like, oh my God, what am I doing this for? And um, once I got into private practice, I realized the, the, the importance of, of implants. And again, again, this is 1996. So Brandemark MK4s, you put them in, you wait for six months, and you uncover them, and you give somebody a tooth, right? Mm. Uh, as things progressed, I got to, to uh, Bismarck, and my partners were very vision forward. They knew the future of dentistry would be implant-driven to a great extent. And um, they were very uh, on the sort of cutting edge. So we had large accounts with different companies, 3i at that time, and a company called... Uh, God, I'm trying to remember their name. They were, uh, anyway, they were, they were conical implants back in the day. LifeCore. I don't know if you remember those guys. Yeah, LifeCore. Yeah. LifeCore yeah. implants. Mm -hmm. So we went to the implant meetings, and I started going to the Chicago implant meeting and learned to start to really learn and delve into the implant part of surgery. And um, it became something I was really interested in, which led me to the next path of life. So let's let's talk about something that influenced our next path of life. And in the mid first decade of the 2000s, there's this procedure that we start listening about, a uh, procedure that comes out of Portugal with Paulo Malo, where uh, in a very novel fashion, he is taking care of patients on the same day with as little as four dental implants and his procedure called the all-on-four treatment concept which is probably one of the most significant advances in implant dentistry that we've ever had. And I think it's recognized as, as like a groundbreaking type procedure. And you and I, in our private practices independently, you and your surgery practice, me and my prosthodontic pra practice, start listening about it. Correct. So the first exposure, I believe, was in 2006 at the Nobel meeting and the world conference that they had. And um, frankly, it was hard to conceptualize uh, being able to place implants the same day and have somebody walk out with a set of teeth. Um, you're taught from, again, from Brandemark's osteointegration theories and uh, Rangard and, and all those other luminaries that, hey, you need to wait four to six months for osteointegration to occur. Obviously, things have changed, and the thought of osteointegration is vastly different from what it used to be, you know, in the 80s. So my first exposure with Timia loading was using the Nobel Guide, and that was developed by Nobel as a surgical guide to allow for immediate loading of implants to a pre-made prosthesis. So that was pretty cumbersome, I have to ask, say, honestly, back in 2006 and seven, It was full of little pitfalls, and um, when I did see the, I actually watched Mala's videos, on the whole on four, I was greatly surprised and impressed how you can navigate without a guide and be able to achieve even better results using freehand implant placement and your techniques for picking up the the, the uh, temporary abutments. So now we're now we're hitting 2007. Two entrepreneurs that partnered together, one with a background in telecommunications, mm -hmm. Steve Boyd and another one, a general dentist from Colorado, Don Maloney, that pioneered like kind of like the same day denture Correct. service, start this company, and word comes out that they're looking for a location in Arizona. And you and I start talking to them independently, and we, we visit uh, the original center in Denver where Dr. Ole Jensen, uh, oral surgeon, and Dr. Mark Adams are performing these procedures, and eventually were introduced serendipitously at a dinner event. Correct, correct. What, what do you recall of that meeting? Well, the uh, I definitely recall my uh, visit to Denver. <laughs> it was very memorable indeed. What's, what really impressed me was how, how quickly and easily uh, Dr. Jensen was performing the surgeries. Uh, I was like, immediately impressed, and also taken back thinking, gosh, I'm going to, if I do this, will I be ever as proficient and as efficient as he was? The other, what I remembered was um, just a massive scale of the office. 
<laughs> yeah. the, lar- the largeness of the office and the, 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 uh, basically the very efficient manner in which it ran. I came back to Phoenix, was very excited, and we got connected for dinner. And uh, our first dinner was at Cafe Pino. Correct. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and I remember going there, we're just chatting. And uh, I think I remember, if I, don't, if I remember correctly, there was some, maybe some doubts and this is actually going to take off the ground. And uh, if this is actually going to be a procedure that will be there a year from now, two years from now, never mind 20 years from now. Yeah, I remember having that conversation. Yeah. For me personally, I'm a second generation dentist and grew up with my father having an implant center uh, that he operated by himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so being able to partner with with an oral surgeon for me was was very exciting. And uh, as as we moved on with the conversations and this this match was created and we opened our center, we caught a little bit of slack. You're under you're being very kind with the word slack. <laughs> I think you're you might, uh, yeah, you're being kind. Uh, we did. Uh, so any any industry that's disruptive to the status quo is gonna catch slack. So disruption disruptive in which ways? Number one was direct to consumer advertising. That was very disruptive in 2007. The second was, oh my God, they're only placing four implants to hold a whole set of teeth, 12 to 14, whatever the occlusion would be. How can this happen? Second of all, how can this be loaded immediately? And how can you guys literally pull this off? And I think a lot of it had to do with fear of the unknown, really. And uh, sometimes when you're beaten to the punch, I hate to say it, you might have a little bit of envy that, hey, how come I didn't think of that? And honestly, I think it was a lot of um, feel, uh, feel of fear of the unknown, really. It was just like, hey, these guys are coming with this. Uh, this is going to work. Are they going to be able to pull this off? Are the patients going to benefit from it? And it, obviously, the same folks that were distractors back in the day or detractors back in the day are full supporters of that today. Correct. And they're also practicing the same thing today. Yeah. So it's funny how history kind of comes back on you. Yeah, that's right. You know, having been in my practice limited to prosthodontics prior to jumping into this venture, I, I was very focused on the restorative side of what I did and making sure that the teeth that I designed look good, function good, and all this. And the, when we started working together and we start looking at 15, 20, 30 CBCT images a day, my first thing was that I had to take a step back and kind of revisit all the anatomy that we learned in dental school that you dealt with in a daily basis in your practice and principles of physiology and and whatnot. What what did you have to do? Well, I had to learn how to process things. <laughs> and, Sorry. Uh, no, no, it's okay. It's that's how you learn. That's how you grow, right? So um, the idea is to be able to manage the anatomy, place the implants in the position that's ideal for you to give the patient the best outcome. And, um, you know, replacing one tooth is, I don't want to say easy, but it's fairly simple. Replacing a whole set on someone that has, let's say, a mal, mal, let's say class three occlusion or class two deep bite occlusion or some other issues. It's, it's difficult. And to be able to achieve that surgically on a day after day, case after case basis, I definitely had to learn what, how you thought, what you were looking for. And ultimately, I think that's what led to the success is our success was that fact that we're able to climb in each, each other's shoes and be able to kind of see things from the other side to see what I need to give you and vice versa. And um, you always always remember my favorite phase, the enemy of be- good is better, right? So you learn to, to say, hey, this is the best what we can do for this person, but that best is gonna be far, far better than when they walk through the door with. True, and I remember hearing this quite often in, in our conversations. Going back to the fear of the unknown, I think that some of that environment that was being developed around us motivated me to want to learn more, explore more, and be really good at what we were doing. And as year one and year two went by, and 
we developed a comfort of working together and working for the benefit of our patients, then we start to see more complicated cases. Correct. And, and our desire to help people led us to explore other approaches, placing implants in the vomer area, mm -hmm. in the pterygoid plate, in the zygomatic arch. You really went full in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, see one, do one, teach one. No, but so I'm going to touch back, come back one second to what you said is to sort of the, um, the challenges on the, on the outside world made us, made us to be better. So I always practice as if my, my surgery is going to be reviewed by independent peers, right? I was always, I'm going to do this, place these implants. How is someone going to look at them? So I'm going to say something right now. Yeah. Practicing with integrity. Yeah. yeah. So how, is, how am I going to be viewed for doing this surgery five years from now? And, you know, I'm a stickler about, about certain things like, um, are these implants symmetrical? <laughs> are they, are they, Mirror <laughs> images left they, and right. Exactly. But, yeah. so, but those things are the, the details. The details, the details, the details. And the details led to over 6,000 cases with, with a success rate that today is unrivaled anywhere else. Correct. It's I still sometimes present to my uh, co you know colleagues, and they're still looking at those slides a little cross-eyed and say, "Ah, oh, are you sure those are right?" Yes, they are. And as far as pushing the envelope, you know, I do remember our first patient that we did zygoma on. The guy had eight failed surgeries. Correct. Eight. The, 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 the ability to be able to help him and the fact that he's still in those same implants today, 16 years later, is truly amazing. We did that surgery on a Saturday, remember? It was I a Saturday. We closed the remember. center so you just focus on this one person because I thought the case was so difficult, which it is and it was. And I remember going to the first zygoma course with um, at Bedrosian, and I showed him that case, and he said, that might not want to be your first case. <laughs> <laughs> and sure it's it was. It's already scheduled. It's already, yeah, exactly. So I'm here because it's already scheduled. Well, I, I think that, again, just to touch on what some, something that you mentioned a moment ago, when you put the patient first, mm -hmm. when you are looking after the patient, and when we were so in tune with that being our ultimate goal, it allowed us to be able to practice together, Correct. practice successfully, and, and deliver some uh, incredible results. Let's move forward to kind of the environment that we're living in right now. It's a lot of digital. Correct. Now, and in my role as chief clinical officer for Integrity Dental Services, I often speak with oral surgeons. Tell me how has your relationship with dental labs in the last few years evolved? Well, the, the, the relationship started in my own office with uh, doing cases that Completing cases where the the labs, the lab techs would come in and help with the conversion. So all of a sudden, you know, I learned how to be, uh, you know, one-tenth of a prosthodontist. Then I had to learn to be one-tenth of a lab tech, right? You have to, because if you don't know steps, you don't know the steps involved, you can't even begin to complete your task successfully. So that, that was phase one. And then um, we got that mastered. And all of a sudden, wait a minute, it's digital that comes in. <laughs> so you have to, next level, level of analog to yeah, digital. The next level of evolution. And at first, it was very, it still is, it's in some ways, it's a very, um, it's a very, not honestly nebulous, but it's a very crowded space. With a lot of systems in place, a lot of scanners, a lot of software that sometimes you don't know which one to choose, you don't know which one is the best. Uh, lab A employs software B, lab B employs software C, you know. So what, who's doing what and why? Uh, so now I'm in the process of learning that. And uh, it, I have to say that, yes, oral surgeons that you talk to are wanting to know how to use the software, but I'm not sure they're doing it for the right reasons. So why am I saying that? Mm -hmm. uh, because I think they're trying to eliminate steps in the process. And the steps they're trying to eliminate are steps that perhaps a process would be involved with, which uh, maybe I'm stepping off the sheet here. But when those steps are eliminated, things usually don't go very well. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. Yeah. I mean, it seems that now there is a big push towards rushing the case. Correct. And getting everything completed as fast as a machine can make it. But 
this procedure involves biology. Yes. Involves a human being's body healing. Correct. Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, the surgery for, uh, let's say, all on X, doesn't matter if it's four or six, mm -hmm. zygoma or vomer pterygoids, um, involves placing an implant in the bone. Uh, that's an injury. The body has to recover from the injury. The entire inflammatory pathway is, for, is triggered. The healing process is triggered, as we all know, within two to four weeks, the resorption of bone around the implant happens, and then the position, and finally, a stable environment for the implant to be locked into, all right? If I, if I could quote the literature, I think the micromotion tolerance is between 100 to 150 micrometers mm -hmm, on correct. those implants. So if someone rushes biology, those very simple principles are not, are not really um, um, followed. And usually implants don't tend to integrate very well in, under those principles. They might have some fibrous integration, or parcel integration, but at the same token, they're not going to have the lifespan that you're looking for. At least that's my personal opinion. Again, no science behind it, but if you, if you, I believe if you um, don't pay homage or respect biological processes, ultimately you're going to get in trouble. I agree with you. I agree with you completely. With, with all these digital technologies that are out there, probably the most revolutionary one was one that we adopted about 16 years ago, of course, you have it in your practice, the CBC kit. Correct. You know, before you would try to do your treatment planning off a pano, but the CBCT completely changed everything. Correct. And then it became a must in offices. And, and that was a concern back then because if one surgeon would have a CBCT, it kind of made it mandatory for every surgeon mm -hmm. to have a CBCT. What is your view on, on how that changed your way of practice? Well, uh, you know, having grown up in, this, in, in the hospital with C CTs, everything was CT. You never fractured CT. You always, you always had a CT behind you, but that was a hospital setting. Once you got into the office, our first CT was, what, 2007 in the office. Well, actually, eight. It really made you very... A, it really opened your eyes, right? It, it, it made you understand what you're able to do or not able to do. Mm -hmm. Obviously, once you see, things, uh, see anatomy in 3D, it totally changes your view of uh, implant placement. And what it also does, it opens your eyes to other places where you can place implants, where panners cannot. I mean, no, no static film can do that. But anything that's like a three-dimensional CT they can manipulate will definitely improve your ability to place implants in spots where before you never you didn't think you could. Yeah, it's impossible not to Correct. use that technology. I can't imagine nowadays. not not having one. It's and just... and there's a there's a great number of workflows now that are evolving where the C B C T is an incredible part of the restorative procedure. Correct. And that's coming down uh, in the next few months, but that's really exciting. Yeah. You're an avid reader. I learned that. When, uh, when uh, during the years that we worked together, uh, one of the books that we shared reading was Jim Collins' Good to Great. His first sentence in his book, it was, uh, good is the enemy of great. Yeah. You have an incredibly successful oral surgery practice. Well, thank you. You to our oral and dental implant surgery. How do you transmit your vision? to your team so that they can carry that vision with you? It's uh, one simple sentence. You walk it. <laughs> you walk in, you do what you need to do, but you are the example. You do what you say you're going to do. You act like you say you should act. And you basically are the role from minute one to the end of the day. It's, you know, the walk, walk the walk and talk the talk. You have to do that. It's leadership by, leadership by example. It goes to emotional intelligence. All those, I actually, we both read Emotional Intelligence, Correct. another great book. Oh, yeah. So it, it definitely, if you're not leading with integrity, if you're not acting with integrity, no one else is going to follow that. They're all just going to do their own thing. Yeah, so that, that creates an incredible culture of accountability Correct. in the office. Correct. And 
if you're talking the talk, people will will follow that. Correct. So, so ironically, so I'm one of the few offices. I don't even have an office manager. This is kind of crazy, right? Yeah. Because everybody knows what they're supposed to do. Everybody is responsible what they're supposed to do. And if they can't, just can't do it on their own, they have communication between them, and finally they come to me. But that rarely ever happens. That's incredible. That's yeah. amazing. And that's uh, congratulations well, to your success on, thanks. on implementing that culture aspect in your, in your practice. Of course, oral surgery is a referral-based practice, mm -hmm. mostly. Communication is an incredible tool. It is. Handling those referrals. What are your, what are your key aspects of communication with your referral offices? Texting. <laughs> it's incredible, huh? Well, you know, um, if you call my office after hours, guess what? You get my cell phone number. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, if you have a problem, call this number. And that's really my cell phone. Mm -hmm. And every uh, referral that I work with has that number. And I'll, I can pull up my cell phone. I'll show you all the different messages from different referrals. Hey, I saw a patient. Why? What do you think? I, tell me out with this. So that's really, it's b being available and being uh, really transparent. And just, I used to go pick up the phone and write a letter. But honestly, the, with technology these days, is texting so easy. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's availability. It's yeah. a, hey, I'm here. It's being available. Yeah. Correct. Cool. Um, going back to, to the book from Jim Collins. He highlights three principal aspects. Disciplined people, mm -hmm. which you describe that, that you have in your office. Disciplined thought that Correct. you transmit to your team. And disciplined action. Correct. Level five. <laughs> Level five. Okay. <laughs> How did you adopt these into your practice? Now, you, you don't learn this when you're doing your residency. No, Nobody you teaches you how to run a practice. Okay, you're absolutely 100% correct. So looking back at my past, I was lucky that in North Dakota I had some great mentors. And one of them, Jerry Corbush, he was the, um, the I always managed a senior partner of the practice. And he had an MBA in practice management, and he happened to have a dissertation in manage, you know, practice management oral surgery practice. And he's the one I would credit to how to run a practice efficiently, how to manage your staff efficiently, and more importantly, how you treat your staff. And then my other partner, Scott Preisler, was my mentor in surgery. He's the guy I wanted to be like. <laughs> the guy that was grease lightning with amazing hands and great people skills. So you leave Chicago, you land in this practice, and you get two incredible mentors. Besides, obviously, coming down and having our, our uh, time together. Yeah, that, that was incredible. Those were memorable years of practicing together. Where do you see that oral surgery is heading to in the broad scope of dental practicing? So couple of things, you know, demographics are going to have a part in with the future oral surgery. Um, demographics of a, a shrinking population pool, meaning on our end, as far as oral surgeons, mm -hmm. uh, the amount of uh, folks that are retiring without people to replace them. So a man slash woman power shortage is, is, has been with us and it's going to, I think, continue to get, get worse. Um, I think a lot of uh, oral surgeons are, have been attracted to sort of non-traditional uh, practice roles, meaning um, DSOs, meaning uh, traveling from office to office to do surgery rather than having their own office. And to me, that's a little little, little um, discouraging, to be honest with you, because I think as, as a goal is you always want to have your own business. But I know things change. I know uh, the pressures of ec economic pressures on the young surgeons are very different than what I faced. Uh, it's not common for, now, for a surgeon now to graduate with a half million dollars worth of debt. And obviously, no one's going to lend the money to open a practice or never mind buying one. So they have to do what they can to be able to basically pay their debt and be able to practice and live. So that's, I think that's a huge change in, in the business model of oral surgery. But as far as uh, um, the, the actual nuts and bolts, I think hospital surgeries are decreasing and most surgeons practice in your office. Um, obviously, there's anesthesia. Units, uh, mobile anesthesia units that come to the office to allow surgeons to allow more in their offices. And um, I think surgeons are do, trending more, again, towards implant-based procedures versus 25, 30 years ago where most of them didn't even want to think about it. Like avoiding 
Laforts and yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So a lot of guys don't practice that kind of oral surgery anymore. No TMJ, no Lafort surgery. Yeah. Trauma is still there, pathology is there, but I'm not sure how much worth it. I think it makes up. It's interesting to see that approach and yeah. The future is bright, I believe. It is bright. Uh, it is bright. that you're looking after patients and, you know, taking care of what their needs are. Correct. So, but that that's, that has to be, again, a for, forefront of someone's practice mentality and, and practice uh, judgment. Excellent. Well, Caesar, thank you very much. Well, my pleasure. Uh, for being our guest here in our second episode. Oh, I'm honored. Uh, yeah. Well, you had to be. Uh, you had to be one of the first guests. Well, thank you. Um, so in our second episode of Practicing with Integrity with Dr. Cesar Butura, oral and maxillofacial surgeon in Phoenix, Arizona, and the owner of Butura Oral and Dental Implant Surgery Practice in Phoenix, we learned about the practice of oral surgery and how this practicing oral surgery has evolved in relationships with uh, other specialists with general dentists and, and, of course, with labs, always in the interest of offering patients the best solution possible. I want to thank you sincerely for being my guest, taking time out of your busy well, practice you. schedule, commuting from one office to the <laughs> other, and sharing with our listeners your views in implant dentistry and the overall practice of oral surgery. Well, again, thank you for having me. It's been an amazing 16 years that we got to work together and we definitely broke a lot of boundaries. <laughs> Indeed we did. Indeed we uh, did. I don't know how much time we have left, but I always go back to this one story from our AO meeting in 2011 in, in Washington. Correct. When we presented a poster on immediate loading zy zygomatic implants against the lower level four. I remember that. Yeah. And uh, people were looking at us like, what are you doing? <laughs> exactly. And we're next to some person presenting on guided Tissue regeneration, <laughs> not to knock that by any means, not to no. knock that, but anyway, we're we're soaring with the you know the, the, the eagles, soaring with the supersonic jets. I remember having a beautiful dinner. Uh, yeah, while while being in Washington yes, D.C. with did. Baldwin Marshak and your dad. And, yeah, my my dad was there. <laughs> well, listeners can go to phoenixbusinessradiox.com uh, to listen to the show live. They can also search for my podcast, uh, Practicing with Integrity, on the Business Radio X Network, and major platforms like Spotify, Apple, iHeart, Google, and Spreaker. Feel free to share with family, friends, and colleagues, and look forward to the next episode. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Practicing with Integrity. Stay tuned as we navigate the fascinating landscape of oral health, where integrity meets innovation.